Hi, everybody. Great to have you joining me this afternoon. Um, welcome to the Brennan Center for Justice. This is an event in which we will be analyzing the role of Newt Gingrich in modern politics. I'm Allison Camerata. I am the co-anchor of CNN's morning show called New Day. I will be your moderator for this event. And uh, I also want to just give you a little bit of background before we tell you who our scholar is. Um, the Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy institute. It's affiliated with New York University's School of Law. They are partnered in producing this event with NYU's John Bradamus Center, which is dedicated to debate on politics, public policy, and other major issues facing our world. So today we are here to consider the impact and the legacy of former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. And by the time this chat is over, you will be astonished at how big a role Newt Gingrich continues to play in the politics that we all are living every day. From the contract with America, to the rise of the Tea Party, to the Trump presidential campaign, Gingrich's fingerprints can be seen all over some of the most divisive episodes in contemporary American politics. He forged this path of bitterly partisan politics that we all wrestle with every single day. So the scholar behind this latest research is Julian Zelizer. He is a professor of history and public affairs at Princeton University. He's also my colleague at CNN where he serves as the political analyst and he is the author of this fabulous new book called Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of a Speaker and the Rise of the New Republican Party. Welcome, Professor. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be doing this with you. Uh, as I have said to you, Professor, it is great to see you other than at 4.30 in the morning as we used to run into each other in CNN back before this pandemic madness. Um, but anyway, it's wonderful to see you. And it's such a terrific book. I mean, honestly, I haven't stopped thinking about it since I cracked it because the way you describe the seeds that were planted by Newt Gingrich and how they have taken blossom now is just really compelling. So we'll get, I have a million questions for you, but first, before jumping in, I just wanna let everybody know that you too can uh, pose questions to Professor Zelizer, so you can type them into the Q&A box. Um, and then uh, about half an hour, roughly from now, I will begin taking your questions, so I will look forward to that. Okay, Professor. Um, basically, your premise is that, you know, Newt Gingrich was um, highly influential and that we continue to grapple with his influence and legacy even today. So let's just start at the beginning. I mean, how did you fasten on the subject matter of, of Newt Gingrich and why was he so compelling to you? Yeah, I became interested in this before uh, Donald Trump was a candidate for the presidency or he was president. The book started around 2013. Gingrich was someone I had touched on in many other books that I've written, and I always thought he was incredibly influential to what the Republican Party became after the 1970s. We focus on Ronald Reagan, uh, but I thought training our eye to Capitol Hill was important. And Gingrich was a real power broker, and, and he brought to Washington before he was speaker, long before he was speaker, a new vision of partisanship, uh, a much more aggressive smash mouth idea that all institutions, all norms, all people were subject to partisan warfare. Uh, and in his mind, that was the only way Republicans were ever gonna get power on Capitol Hill, where they hadn't had power since the 1950s. Uh, and unlike some other people who are mavericks, who are arguing to be much tougher in politics, he becomes one of the leaders of the party. And I wanted to capture that shift, and I wanted to write about that history, and finally, I wanted to start writing a history of partisanship. We talk about it all the time. We talk about this abstract thing that's happened to us. So I wanted to put a, a face to how this happened and focus on some moments that were transformative. That part is so interesting, Professor, and I really appreciated that because I don't think a week goes by, maybe not a day, where somebody doesn't say to me, how did we get here? You know, you hear pundits, you hear mostly Democrats, um, you hear real people, you know, out in the world at dinner parties or, or wherever say like, how did we get here? How did it 
become so partisan? Has it always been like this? Why is it so nasty? And you really took the time to kind of retrace the steps and pinpoint with some precision the moment it started. And so when was that? 1989. And uh, that's a big year in Washington, even though many people don't necessarily think of it that way. And that's when Newt Gingrich, who was still seen in much of Washington as a political bomb thrower, some thought of him as a new Joe McCarthy. Many Republicans thought, well, this is someone we have to be a little careful with because he's, he's doing things that are pretty toxic. In 1989, as a result of a two-year campaign, he pressures Speaker Jim Wright, who's a Democratic speaker from Texas, in May of 1989, to resign from his seat as a result of uh, accusations about his ethical background. And because of his success at bringing down the speaker, Republicans vote and they make him the House Minority Whip, which uh, outside of Washington sounds like a technical term, but in Congress, that's a leadership position. So they take this person and they put him and make him a leader, which is a big moment. And that's his path to becoming speaker and to becoming the Newt Gingrich we all know. And because he's successful bringing down the Speaker of the House, it had never happened in American history, it legitimates what he was saying. It legitimates his form of partisanship. And many Republicans say, well, there's something to what Newt's doing, and they, they sign on to this uh, strategy. I mean, you write about this in almost soap operatic um, terms. Why did he train his sights on Speaker of the House? Jim Wright. I mean, did he have a, was this strategy or did he have some sort of personal battle with him? No, it wasn't personal. Uh, I mean, uh, Gingrich, since the first time he ran for Congress in 1974, he lost the first two times. What was amazing to me when I looked at his archives, he always had a very uh, consistent strategy. His strategy was in the aftermath of Watergate, in the aftermath of Vietnam, when so many Americans distrusted government and believed everything was rotten, he would focus, instead of Richard Nixon, on the Democrats in Congress. And he would argue they were a corrupt majority. And he would argue they retained their power unfairly. And, and they used uh, everything uh, to their power to stop Republicans from participating, et cetera, et cetera. It was an anti-establishment populist argument. And uh, he tried to take down Tip O'Neill, who was the speaker uh, until 1986, but he was unsuccessful. O'Neill was very good and turned out to be effective in the media. He even appeared on the show Cheers uh, and became like a loved figure. But Jim Wright wasn't that person. Uh, he had stories that were written about him uh, by investigative journalists raising questions about some relations with lobbyists in Washington, in his district, uh, and the sale of a book. Uh, he used to sell a book of speeches in bulk to interest groups when he would speak to them. Uh, and so there was some stuff that seemed shady, and that was perfect for what Gingrich wanted to argue. This was the guy he was going to turn into the most corrupt speaker. And Wright was also old school politics. He wasn't very good in cable television. He wasn't very good in the modern media world, and he was kind of caught off guard when Gingrich came after him. So let's talk about what Gingrich's secret sauce was that allowed him to do this. So from your book, I get character assassination, yeah. um, the violating of norms, and I guess the, I don't know, the tearing down of government institutions. I mean, is that, is that the triumvirate of, of tactics that he used? That's the trifecta, and I would say that the news media was his platform to do much of this, rather than working uh, inside the halls of Congress. Uh, the, the character assassination is one of the three. He was introducing words to talk about Democrats that were, that were pretty extreme. Uh, I, I quote, uh, I mean, he used terms like loony left all the time, and he accused Democrats of not supporting uh, America's security. But in 1990, at the end of my story, he puts out this memo through something called GOPAC, which was a political action committee uh, that he controlled. And he tells Republicans, if you want to speak like Newt, these are the words you have to use to describe Democrats. And the words are like sick, traitorous, radical, really blistering rhetoric. And, and so, yes, that's the trifecta. And that's just the flavor 
of one of the one of the elements of that. And so, how did Republicans? Let's start with Republicans, and then we'll get to the media and Democrats. But Republicans didn't like this, right? They didn't like his tactics. They weren't comfortable with it. But they made this Faustian deal. Why? Because they had not been in power in Congress since the 1950s. Since 1954, if you were a House Republican, you lived all the time as part of a permanent minority. So you had no influence. You didn't really participate in legislation. You didn't set the agenda. And, and many senior Republicans, like House Minority Leader Bob Michael, this, this was the status quo. So they did the best they could. They worked with Democrats. They tried to participate in governing decisions. But many Republicans by the 80s, when Reagan is in the White House and they felt there was a conservative revolution taking over, they start to find Gingrich more appealing, at least in terms of what he promises. He promises, I will bring you a majority eventually, but you have to do what I want to do. And what was fascinating in studying the 80s is this separation between Republican leaders who thought this was dangerous stuff and Republican leaders who said, well, let's bring him into the leadership and we'll contain him. Uh, the, the separation between those two, it, it shrinks very quickly during the course of the 80s. And even someone like the House Minority Leader, Bob Michael, who is quintessential old Washington, nice person, believes in working with Democrats, he starts to echo a lot of the rhetoric that Gingrich is using. And you can just see how this changes. And when, when there's a, a vote on the House Minority Whip, which is the position Gingrich gets, he gets the support of people like Olympia Snow, Nancy Johnson, moderates, who say, well, maybe he will bring us a path to power. It is really hard for me not to jump forward right now to 2016 or 2020, but I am resisting that because I know we'll get to that. But I mean, everything, so much of what you're saying, I feel like you could just be reporting on the news of the day. And I mean, and again, it's just fascinating to see that the seeds were planted in 1989. Okay, so Democrats, what, what was their thinking about when Newt Gingrich was taking power? Were they... Were they dismissive of him? What did they do? They were dismissive of him. I think most of the Democrats, not all, but most thought eventually he would go away. They thought eventually Republicans were going to contain him. Uh, and they didn't imagine this was the wave of the future. So Jim Wright often referred to him as a gadfly and uh, privately and in his diary that he kept and, and said, you just have to like, kind of swat them away, meaning Gingrich. Uh, and, and he believed in the end that it would be like Joe McCarthy, meaning eventually the system would rein him in. Eventually the Republicans would come to their senses. And he was like many Democrats. He just didn't see which way the winds were blowing in American politics. And many Democrats were not good at fighting back. I mean, when, when Gingrich raised ethical accusations about Jim Wright, Jim Wright's response was to have his lawyers do a data dump to reporters of very technical explanations of why Jim Wright had never violated an ethics rule, never violated a law. It wasn't exciting stuff, but it showed you why this was all fabricated. And Gingrich would just go in front of reporters and say, he's the second, he's the most corrupt speaker in American history, period, and walk away. And a lot of Democrats still weren't good in this new media age that was taking place and, and they're caught off guard. And uh, I think that was the mentality of almost all of them. When will Democrats learn that sloganeering works? You know, I mean, how many times do Democrats have to learn that message? But, but therein, I mean, enter the media. And so how did the media deal with Gingrich? Well, the media is often used by Gingrich. Gingrich is incredibly uh, kind of, he has a great instinct for how the media was changing in the 80s and, and the two parts of it that he saw instantly he could weaponize. One was a cable television provided ways to speak to broad audiences uh, directly and be investigative journalists after Watergate were doing hard work trying to dig up dirt, but he saw that uh, he could use that for partisan purposes. Uh, uh, the cable was really important. And 
he really believed in getting out his message and getting it to the public. And, and one story I tell was in 1984, this is early in the story, uh, he and a group of allies realized that this new station C-SPAN, which covered the floor of the house every day, it had been an uh, invention of the 1970s when Congress tried to open up and put sunshine onto what they did. It was a great tool. So he and his colleagues at the end of every day when everyone had left, they got on the floor and they made speeches attacking the Democrats of being weak on defense, of not caring about the security of the nation, of not supporting Ronald Reagan's wars against communism in Central America. And Gingrich and his allies would ask specific Democrats to respond. They'd say, how do you respond to that? And if you were watching C-SPAN, it looked like there was no response. It was totally quiet. But what you couldn't see, because the rules of the House only let you see the speaker, like Zoom, uh, was that it was an empty chamber. There was no one there. Uh, and it was incredibly effective at getting the message out. Democrats get so mad that the speaker at the time, Tip O'Neill, orders the cameras to pan the chamber and show this is just theater. And then the networks, all three networks, ABC, CBS, and uh, NBC, cover this story. Look at what happened on C-SPAN. Look at this Gingrich guy. And that was what Gingrich wanted. He understood that if he gave the media conflict, if he gave him confrontation, he'd be the story. And all of a sudden, in 1984 already, this Gingrich guy was on all the networks and in all the major newspapers. So that's an example of how he used uh, the new media to his advantage. And that had a, a name, right? Cam Scam or something? Cam Scam, that's what it was called, right. It was post Watergate, everything gets named. And even that was something he thought carefully about. Okay, so fast forward to um, 2016, when Donald Trump is running. Um, I mean, so much of what you're talking about was echoed in that race, in terms of the character assassination, in terms of coming up with names for Democrats, nasty names for Democrats, in, in terms of the easy slogans, um, you know, versus Democrats, more technical explanations. And so, I mean, was Donald Trump following the play? Did he know he was following the playbook of Gingrich? Or was it just kind of embedded into our, our vernacular at that point? I think it's embedded in our vernacular, and that ended up being uh, part of what I wanted to show through the history, meaning this has uh, been going on for a long time, and the Republican Party really remade itself over many generations, starting with Gingrich. So by the time uh, Trump ran for president, the party had changed, and, and he didn't have to be a student of history. He didn't even have to think self-consciously about what his strategy is. As someone who had seen the Republican Party in the Obama years, who absorbed a lot of conservative television and media, this is what you would see as the political style of the GOP. Um, and so I, I think of it more like that. And I think he also understood that if he did what he did, at some level, he would still have strong support in the party because the, the party wasn't what people imagined it to be anymore. Uh, so I, that's how I try to kind of make the connection. There also, though, was personal connection. Gingrich is one of the finalists uh, for the vice presidential selection. Uh, he actually goes to Indianapolis and is interviewed in the final days by the Trump family and Trump advisors uh, like Paul Manafort. I start my book with an interview he did with Sean Hannity uh, where he's explaining how he and Trump are both pirates. They're anti-establishment figures. They don't listen to what others tell them to do. And he also admits two pirates on a ticket might be too much. Uh, and since uh, Trump became president, uh, Gingrich has written, I think, five books now. A new one just came out on the Trump presidency, really showing him to be a transformative president. So uh, I think it's not that he studied Gingrich. I think Gingrich changed the party. But there's also been this very uh, close, direct relationship, which is kind of interesting. Uh, just because you brought it up, I do want to read that passage from, again, your book, I think it's, as you said earlier, on page four. And I just want to read it because I thought that the, the way you described that interview that Gingrich did with Hannity is really uh, illuminating. 
So I'll, I'll read this passage. Um, you say, um, okay, so he was, uh, Trump was deciding, he was considering Gim, Gingrich for VP. You write, the camera light flashed on in the Indianapolis newsroom and the interview began. Listening to Hannity's voice through his earpiece, Gingrich jumped into the discussion with Verve. As the Fox host offered the Georgian friendly questions about his meeting with Trump and his vice presidential prospects, Gingrich launched a fusillade of persuasion, listing the obvious similarities between himself and Trump that would make them ideal partners. Quote, look, in many ways, Donald Trump is like a pirate. He's outside the normal system and he gets things done. He's bold. He's actually like a figure out of a movie. In a lot of ways, my entire career has been a little bit like a pirate. I've taken on the establishment of both parties. I'm very prepared to fight in the media. And I just thought that that, that captures it all, doesn't it? I mean, it shows Gingrich's sense of self, that he fancies himself a pirate, um, and that he's proud that Donald Trump seems to be following in his, you know, piratey sails. And then, but as you point out, uh, two pirates is more than one ticket could handle. And so, you know, Donald Trump didn't go with him as vice president. And was he hurt or was he expecting that? Or did he want to be, a, you know, a vice president? What was, what, how was Newt Finger, how did he I, take I, that? I don't know. I don't know kind of how he felt about that. And uh, I, I could imagine him feeling different ways. Obviously there's part of him that wants to be in the White House. He ran in 2012 for the presidency. Fun fact, Kellyanne Conway was one of his top advisors for that. Uh, and then, you know, he was in the running, I think would have been interested in being part of the White House. Uh, so I, I assume, I can't read in his mind, there was disappointment, but I do think there's a lot of satisfaction because of exactly the quote you read. He is very perceptive and I think he can see uh, what, what's played out in the last few years is a manifestation of his style in the White House, uh, very clearly. And I, I can't imagine he doesn't see that connection. And so when he writes now, and, and he's often in the forefront of, of defending the Trump administration, it, it makes sense. I, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, this is his baby in some ways, and he's watching it grow. And uh, so I think he still gets satisfaction that way. Do you think that Democrats have learned any lesson or could take some lesson from what they experienced, as you said, back in 1989 or through the 80s with Gingrich? I mean, you know, I, I remember when Trump um, was running and there was always a debate in the Hillary uh, Clinton campaign about how do we handle this? Are we supposed to stoop to the level of name calling and what they saw as vulgarity and things like that, or are we supposed to ignore it? Like that, there's still always a question of, do you elevate it by talking about it? Do you not? I mean, do you think, do you see any change in the tactics that Democrats are using this time around? I think it's hard. And I thought a lot about why back in the eighties, Democrats weren't willing to do that. At some level, they were still checked. And they've remained that way. And I think there's a basic difference in the parties that explains it. Meaning Democrats were and still are a party that believes in government as a centerpiece of their platform, using government to solve social problems, economic problems. There's an argument they make that government is good. Republicans, certainly since Ronald Reagan, have been an anti-government party. Their philosophy is government should be secondary compared to markets, free markets, and government doesn't do good things, and the IRS becomes kind of an embodiment of everything that's wrong. And so Democrats are checked, because if you are a party that believes in government, your partisanship can't destroy government, and you can't uh, deploy a kind of partisanship that creates dysfunction in Washington, because then you've taken away what you promised. Republicans aren't in that place. They can go to extremes. They can create dysfunction. They can do what you often see from Senator Mitch McConnell, just tie up the basic uh, workings of government, because that's fine. Dysfunctional government is exactly what they keep talking about. So I think the parties have those limitations because of that. But I do think, I, I'll say, that younger uh, Democrats, and whether it's AOC or Kate Hunter, any of the 2018 class, they have grown up seeing 
the Gingrich Republican Party. And I do think while many won't go quite as far as what you watch from the GOP, they're gonna be more sophisticated and aggressive and using the media, using social media, speaking uh, more directly about what they believe Republicans are doing. Uh, so I think you'll see a push that way because they understand there's no going back to normal. This is the GOP they've witnessed their whole life. Isn't it a little strange when someone who's as prominent in the Republican Party as Newt Gingrich says or, or um, operates under the belief that he should tear down government institutions? I mean, how does he square that? He's in government. Yeah, I mean, at some level when you do that, you, you don't follow through the logic. I mean, if you're doing things that will make governing impossible, uh, I don't think you go to the next step and say, so where does that leave us? Where does that leave us in the middle of a pandemic if we hit that point? You just don't think that way. You think you're doing right. You think you're fighting a righteous cause uh, at some level. Um, and he's been thinking that way since, since the 80s. But I, I would say, and, and this is in my book, he would explicitly write Republicans Forget bipartisanship, forget civility, forget all these norms you always hear, because if Republicans want power, you can't listen to that. You have to do what you want to achieve power. And I think that's his mentality. I think that is the mentality uh, of a lot of his followers over the years. And you don't go to the next question. How do you govern? What happens if we're in a crisis? How do you deal with normal problems when we're not in a crisis and we're witnessing uh, this right now as we struggle to move forward from this horrible pandemic. Well, exactly. I mean, this has come home to roost. And so when you see everything through a partisan lens, then everything becomes partisan. Mask wearing is partisan. Uh, hydroxychloroquine is partisan. Listening to the CDC is partisan. Like, you know, I have, I have always been struck in my years of covering uh, Donald Trump, even before he was president, that, that, that if that's how you orient the world, are you a liberal or conservative? Are you a Democrat or a Republican, left or right? And that tells me all I need to know about you, which is how some people feel. I think it's how President Trump feels. It's what I, the impression I've gotten from him. Then, then that's an interesting way. I mean, then, then you've just sized somebody up and put them in a box. But I didn't realize until reading your book that, that that's what Newt Gingrich did, right? He, did he see everything through a partisan lens? He did. And it wasn't just that he saw it that way. He insisted on telling that story to the public and having, you know, colleagues say that story, kind of really divide the nation. It was about playing to division rather than running away from it. It was seeing that division was valuable politically. Uh, and I found, I had, when my, my book was done, I had done what's called the galleys, uh, which is once they send you what looks like the book, and you usually can just check for mistakes and typos. But someone sent me this letter my editor allowed me to include that Jim Wright wrote to Newt Gingrich after Gingrich became speaker in 1995. And Wright wrote him uh, kind of a very, uh, a note where he said, I'm really mad at what you did to me. I'm mad that you criminalized me in the public mind. And, and tarred my reputation when I didn't deserve it. And he says in the letter, and this is paraphrasing, I, I forgive you. Uh, I forgive you, good luck as speaker, I hope it goes well for you. And then I looked for the letter back and it took Gingrich many months to write him back. And finally he wrote a very short memo like, you know, thanks for the note, uh, hope everyone, you know, hope you're doing well. And that was it. And, and Gingrich was willing to live with that kind of politics. That's exactly what he did. It's exactly how Jim Wright felt for the rest of his life, but he doesn't have remorse about that. And I think you see that all the time. And it's not just about people, now it's about wearing a mask in a pandemic. And, and that's a dangerous logic when you need the government to handle big problems we face. I mean, and it's about winning and losing, right? And so if you think that you're on the winning team, that's so powerful. I mean, that's so intoxicating, I think, to be on the winning team that you're willing to make, as you describe, a Faustian deal to get there. You know, obviously the end justifies the means. And so, you know, you brought up Olympia Snow. People talk about Susan Collins. People talk about other senators who were perceived always to be moderate or on, somewhere along that continuum. But, you know, winning ends up being 
again, intoxicating. And so is that, is that what you think ultimately the, even the moderates during Gingrich's era decided, and are you seeing that now? It is. I mean, I, people often say, how do you distinguish between different kinds of partisanship? And I think from earlier generations of politicians I studied, right through the 80s, they, they were partisan and they understood, you know, American politics ain't beanbag, as Jim Baker once said, but they balanced partisan tactics and partisan interests with other elements of being in politics, the needs of governance and the ability to make decisions, the needs of the institution so that they're functional and healthy. I think Gingrich was pretty clear that those are secondary at best, that you always elevate that principle of partisanship in your rhetoric, in your actions, in your decision making. That's what he wanted to convince his fellow Republicans to do. And a lot of Republicans signed on and once you're in that mindset, uh, it's not good. I think it's not good for the health of the democratic institutions where you're working. Even I'll, I'll just throw in, you know, I, I even show how George H.W. Bush, when he runs in 1988 for president, he's the vice president, and he's the icon of civil, uh, kind of old school politics and working with Democrats. He runs a blistering campaign against Michael Dukakis. He hires Lee Atwater, who's a cutthroat consultant. He's kind of a kindred spirit to Gingrich. And in the campaign, uh, Bush, who's feeling like he might lose, starts to use some of Gingrich's rhetoric and he brings Jim Wright into the story when no one's talking about Jim Wright. And so I think that's what happens when that the kind of partisan imperative becomes too strong. And uh, I think that explains a lot of where we are right now. Hmm. Um, the questions are already pouring in, but before we get to the questions, I just want to share one personal anecdote that I had with Newt Gingrich because it all came flooding back to me as I was reading your book. And I'm so glad that you wrote this book because of all of the interviews that I have done, and I have done thousands and thousands of interviews in my career, Newt, my interview with Newt Gingrich um, during the Republican National Convention in 2016 was one of the most memorable of my career. And it's because he taught me something that day that I draw upon every day. And basically what happened was he came on to support the candidate, Donald Trump. And he was coming on to say that Donald Trump would be great because he would uh, be a revolutionary candidate, he said, because he would be, you know, law and order and he would fight crime and crime was so bad in the country that he would turn it around. Now, mind you, this was July of 2016. Newt Gingrich came on my set, it was a one-on-one -on -one interview, and he said that with such conviction that crime was so bad and, you know, Donald Trump was the only answer, that for a second it like froze my synapses and then they clicked back in. I was like, oh, wait, but Mr. Speaker, Crime is actually at historic lows. Mm -hmm. Crime is down across the board. We're seeing the lowest crime rate in decades. And he said, and I will, I will read it to you. He said, I said to him, quote, but violent, violent crime is down across the country. We're not under siege, as President Trump said. And he says, Gingrich, the average American, I will bet you this morning, does not think crime is, is down, does not think they are safer. And I said, but we are safer and it is down. And he said, that's your view. And I said, no, that is a fact. And he said, but what I said is also a fact. The American public doesn't feel it. And the current view is that liberals have a whole set of statisticians uh, who theoretically may be right, but it's not where human beings are. People are frightened. And I said, but hold on, Mr. Speaker, these are FBI statistics. This is not a liberal organization. He said, no, but what I said is equally true. People feel it. And that tells you, I mean, I learned so much that day. You deal with facts, he told me. You statisticians deal with facts and I'll deal with how people feel. What do you, what do you think of that exchange? That's very, I mean, that is revealing and it's, uh, it's very familiar from what I've seen in his whole career. I mean, uh, a, just the way he argues is exactly as you capture with a certainty of what he is saying. Uh, even if you throw contradictions uh, in front of him, it doesn't phase him at all. Uh, and, and I think at some level, um, he does 
I mean, that is what he plays to, to feelings, to raw emotion, to anger. Um, those are the narratives he is telling are, are to play to that. But he's willing to say things that are not grounded in, in, in facts. Um, and he'll move through with them. I mean, one of them, I'll, I'll just add, it's a little different, but he was often involved in many ethical problems of his own. And there's this one moment, it's the height of when he's going after Speaker Wright, and, and the heart of the whole attack is a, a book deal that I mentioned earlier that Jim Wright sold books in bulk. This is what he was trying to bring down the speaker for, even though he was actually allowed to do that. And the story broke in the middle of all this. Gingrich was actually under investigation for a rotten book deal of his own, that he had raised money from interest groups to pay, pay for a promotion. And so he had to have a press conference in the middle of all this. And you can still see it on C-SPAN, which is the beauty of doing research for this period. And he just, he rejects the idea there's anything comparable. And he does it with this great certainty. And reporters are saying, isn't this the same thing? Didn't you just do what you're trying to bring the speaker down? And he just says, it's different, not the same. What I did was right, it's a real book. What he's doing is wrong, it's not a real book. And that's how he argues. And that makes him very potent, I think. And it's hard for reporters often to kind of figure out how do you respond, how do you engage that kind of argument uh, when he will not desist, even if you throw the FBI statistics in his face. Right, and I mean, and I can imagine that it's hard for his opponents because if, if somebody is going to corner the market on feelings, well, feelings are powerful. You know, people do vote with their feelings. I mean, I don't know that he's, I don't think he's wrong about that. Mm -hmm. um, so in any event, okay, let me get to some questions because they are pouring in. Um, okay, did Gingrich create a new audience for conservative politics or did he simply harvest an audience that had already existed? I think well, the historians are great because we always say both are true. So, uh, I mean, this is the story of a person. This is the story of a change maker, of a power broker, but he's tapping into changes in conservatism that are bubbling up. You know, you have a big conservative movement that's taking hold during the 1970s and 80s. The religious right, for example, uh, is doing a lot of work at the grassroots level to mobilize the Reagan presidency and the victory in 1980 was a big operation that Gingrich is not part of. He's uh, thrilled by it, but he's not part of. I think what uh, Gingrich is important is he, he takes a lot of this and he offers a partisan strategy for this movement. And not only does he offer how are we going to fight the fight and, and how far are we going to go, but then he brings it into the halls of power. He's not a maverick. He's not actually an outsider. He's the one who has power. He's the one who shapes the party. Uh, so this is a guy capitalizing, bringing together a lot of what's going on within the GOP and then putting it together, I think, in a very effective way. And, and he will be speaker. Uh, kind of he goes in that path. So we're not talking about one Republican among many. This is an extraordinarily influential figure. And when he does this stuff, when he speaks this way, when he does tactics like using ethics rules for partisan advantage, it legitimates it. And it leads future Republicans to do the same. Here's a good question. What role did earlier ideological divides play between Democrats and Republicans? Did that did they fuel or exacerbate the politics of the Gingrich era? And I think that's a great question because nowadays we know how divided we are. I mean, we see the map of you know red versus blue all the time. But in the 80s, was it that pronounced? It was becoming that pronounced, but it wasn't uh, this divided. I mean, one basic difference, uh, the parties were still internally much more divided. Southern Democrats were still part of the Democratic Party. They still had a role. They were much more conservative than Northerners like Tip O'Neill. And Republicans still had a liberal Northeastern wing uh, that would remain actually for at least another decade that kept them uh, a bit in check. So, so you had much more divided parties. And, and when Gingrich is doing this stuff, it is notable. So, I mean, mine is a story of him introducing this and ultimately convincing people to sign on. But it's not as if people then say what he was doing, whoa, I mean, can we really go there? Can we really talk this way? And can we really take the procedures of government and just use them uh, to our advantage? 
And, and now I'm not sure people notice anymore. I mean, I know we all talk about it often, meeting uh, analysts and reporters, but I think most younger people are, this is what they see. And even a lot of the rhetoric of President Trump, they note it, but it's becoming less remarkable. So I think that polarization, it literally got worse, and it also is normalized in a way it wasn't quite there yet in the 1980s. And I mean, I want, this next question is about, I guess, how big of a hand Gingrich had in, in doing that. I mean, I don't want to imbue him with too much power, but, you know, I mean, if he's paving that trail. So this one says, if Gingrich represented a significant change in leadership style, what changes took place in civil society to accept that leadership style. So what was, what was happening simultaneously, or was he really leading the charge? Yeah, I'm not, he's not just responding to the public. I mean, it, it, members of Congress, it's, a, it's an unusual situation. They're not always responding to mass pressure. There's a lot of room. You know, he's elected by a district. The district keeps him in. And so then he's really winning support for different parts of his party on Capitol Hill. It's not about necessarily winning a national mandate to doing what you're doing. And I think he introduces some stuff that is not necessarily being called for. It's not like tons of the uh, Republican electorate was saying, get more toxic right now. They were certainly frustrated. They wanted the Reagan revolution to succeed. Uh, they wanted conservatism to be triumphant, but I don't think that meant that the electorate was necessarily pushing. I think there's room where leaders actually introduce new tactics and popularize those. And then the electorate thinks, well, that's what we do. I think we often have to think of it that way. That's the power of political leaders. Uh, they're not simply responsive. Even conservative, uh, the conservative media, as embodied by conservative television like Fox News, it comes after Gingrich had done much of this. I mean, in some ways, they replicate what congressional politicians were doing rather than vice versa. So I actually think for me, it was, it was eye-opening to see him doing all this when it wasn't clear he had to do it or, or that there was huge demand for him to do it. He won people over, uh, and then it becomes popular with Republicans. One of the things that I was really interested in in your book, and I didn't know anything much about, was his personal life. And he had been, I guess, uh, I mean, an activist might be, he had wanted to be active and to play a big role in politics, I guess, since he was a teenager. And I was interested that he married his teacher. I mean, and that was verboten. I mean, his, the relationship was verboten among, with his parents. He, she, was much, she was older than he was, I mean, only in her 20s, but she was older. He was a teenager and they like stole away and got married. He did, uh, and his stepfather was very angry about this relationship, didn't think it was right. Uh, he ultimately wouldn't go to their marriage, uh, but he's always kind of a rebel. And personally, he definitely didn't live the kind of life uh, that was often uh, identified with the religious right, which was the centerpiece of the conservative movement. So he does that at a young age. Uh, he goes to Emory and Tulane and, and they start a family. Uh, and then his life will get even rockier. Uh, Famously, in 1984, there's a story about him speaking with his uh, first wife about their divorce. Uh, the article actually said, you know, serving him, serving her the papers in the hospital while she's recovering from cancer surgery. Uh, and many stories start to emerge about his having affairs and not living a life that matched up uh, with the party uh, that he envisioned. And so this has been part of Gingrich's whole career. It's like the ethics issue. There's a question of how deep do his ethics and morality really run if that's how he lives his life. Yeah, I mean, I remember uh, certainly when he was going after Clinton, you know, it's hard to hold yourself up as a moral paragon of some kind when you yourself have a checkered past. But he didn't, he, that didn't bother him. That didn't get in his way, I guess. Well, I think it gets back to how he sees politics. Again, he, he's thoroughly partisan. That's how he thinks about everything. And so the issues he picks, I mean, he's a conservative and he believes in tax cuts, deregulation, but ultimately he's about getting his party power. And so I think a lot of the moral issues he talks about are kind of thin 
in terms of how much he cares about them. And, and you look at his personal life, it's hard not to reach that conclusion. I think he's more strategic in how he's using this. That's why a lot of people are angry when he's lobbying ethics grenades at the speaker and people knew he certainly didn't live a very ethical political life, but that doesn't bother him. And, and it's a kind of remarkable psychology, I always think, that he can just live with these things and move forward. Um, here's another question that's coming in. And we touched on it, but I'd like to hear you expound on it. In what ways did Gingrich manipulate the media to push his agenda? And do you see President Trump taking a page from that playbook? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot. And, and so we touched on the cable television and just TV news in general. He, he was very good at it. And uh, he used to say, you have to give them more Indiana Jones than Philharmonic, meaning you needed to give them sizzle, excitement, controversy, and that's what the media would feed as opposed to things that were kind of dry. And even that cam scam story, I have a quote in there that he remarks, it's kind of revealing that this is what they covered when they wouldn't cover what I was speaking about in terms of the issues. They liked the controversy. And so he manipulates that all the time. He'll do that as speaker, I still think he does that, uh, even as an analyst today on, on Fox. Uh, but he also manipulated investigative journalists. I just did a conversation like this um, with Evan Thomas, who worked for Newsweek. He was a, a very good, still is, very good reporter. And he, that struck him in the book, like how much of the 80s generation of post-Woodward and Bernstein reporters, they didn't see how what they were writing was gonna be just absorbed by this new partisan world. And one of Gingrich's great insights was all this investigative journalism out there, which was producing good work and trying to uncover different backroom parts of American politics, how he could take bits and pieces of these stories and, and create a grand narrative that had not yet been proven at all and use that as a bludgeon. Uh, and that was one of his biggest, I think, insights. And a lot of investigative journalists in retrospect were really frustrated. Um, oh, one last one, there's a big story when, uh, when Wright becomes speaker by a very smart, talented reporter who just had joined the New Republic and was one of the editorial team, Robert Wright. And Wright got an assignment to do a piece on Jim Wright. So they're not related. And he writes a piece in the New Republic saying, is this really the speaker for our times? He's kind of old school. He may be a little shady ethically. And he also went on C-SPAN and did an interview, which you can see this Robert Wright. And the questions are coming at him. It was very notable to me watching. He didn't really know much about Congress. It was clear he couldn't answer some basic questions. Was Jim Wright really unethical? Was this true? And in retrospect, he told me, and, and I have this in the book, he, he was kind of caught in this vortex. And his story in the New Republic, where he's a young guy, 31 years old when he wrote it, got picked up and it became another piece for Gingrich to hammer home about Wright. So I think a lot of journalists were really uh, manipulated by him. And that was, that was more important than any other platform he had near Gingrich. That's really interesting. Here's a good question. Um, come on, where'd it go? Uh, if Newt Gingrich was so effective as a conservative politician, why were his presidential runs so unsuccessful? It's a great question. And, and there's a long history of people in American politics that I teach about in my classes who are good at one thing and not necessarily good at the other. And uh, at one level, I think he was very good at congressional politics. He understood the institution. It, it just fit what he was doing. When you run for president, at some level, and, and I understand uh, thoughts people will be having, there is some discipline that's usually required from the candidate to stay on script, to kind of focus on what your team is doing. And what I heard about 2012, that was very hard for him. Uh, he kind of got distracted. He wanted to do other things. <laughs> So that was part of it. Part of it is important to understand he's one of the most hated figures in American politics. I mean, by the time he ended his speakership, he was really disliked. Uh, Democrats certainly don't like him at all. 
And many Republicans still are, are party living with him, but personally, they don't love him. And uh, I don't think he ever was able to overcome that. So I think those are the two reasons he didn't do well. Uh, but as I tell my students, you don't have to be president to have a profound influence on this country. And uh, I, off, I write a lot about Congress. I, I think it's an institution we don't study enough and we don't see the immense influence it can have. I would argue right now, Senator Mitch McConnell is as influential in many ways as, as President Trump. And when we look back at this period, we'll be looking at him and, and what he did to the tenor of politics as well. Yeah, no, your whole book is a testament to that. I mean, about, excuse me, how much influence he can have. Okay, here's another question. Um, if the November election brings a Democratic president and Congress, do you think our politics will become less toxic and partisan? So no, uh, that's, that's an easy answer. And uh, I'm just glancing at my book, uh, although I probably won't find it. I, I have a quote, I'll just paraphrase. I have a quote uh, from President Obama in my book. And uh, he was interviewed after Trump was elected, I think it was in December, by David Remnick of the New Yorker. And it's a, it's a kind of, uh, final interview. Yeah. And he says, and, and, and they, Remnick's asking him, how do you explain Trump? And uh, he, he gives an answer. He says he's not an outlier, that we should have seen this coming, that the party's been changing for decades. Um, and we just haven't been, you know, kind of looking at what the reality is. And, and that's powerful from Obama, because I think a lot of his presidency was a person who hoped this blue-red divide, as he said in 2004, was not real, it was not enduring, who as president saw just how fierce it actually was. And I think that's true right now. I mean, I, the, the idea that Republicans as a party are going to change if Joe Biden is president come January 2021 is very hard to believe. The only thing that would do this is if there is an election so catastrophic uh, for the Republicans, the kind we haven't seen since 1984, uh, that finally shrinks the Republicans so much and causes them to say, for our own interest, we have to start a whole new approach. Maybe. But I would bet on a President Biden having the same experience that President Obama did back in 2009, a party hell-bent on obstruction and unleashing very toxic uh, attacks on the new administration. I mean, and by the way, you know, I don't want to leave the impression that Democrats can't be fiercely partisan. Of course they can, and they play by, you know, some of these rules as well. In fact, there was a question about that, um, but I guess I'll just paraphrase it. Uh, basically, it, but it's the Gingrich Trump model that we're talking about, which is the name calling, the coming up with names, the, the, the willingness to engage in character assassination that you don't necessarily see as much. Am I right or wrong about that? Yeah, I mean, that, that gets back to my comment earlier. I do think there's a difference. And it's not that Democrats aren't very partisan. It's not that there are some Democrats who actually can go, go pretty far in what they're doing. But if you look at the leadership, if you look at Speaker Pelosi and Senator Schumer, I just don't think as a party, and they're just the current version, they don't do exactly the same things. And, and it's, it's the kind of character assassination, but it's even the procedures of politics. And if you think of Senator McConnell, for example, his, what he was willing to do with President Obama's Supreme Court nomination, just not even consider it, or the way in which we have seen government shutdowns normalized as political leverage in debates, which wasn't what we used to do, I think that's different than what you're going to see from a lot of Democrats. So uh, I think political scientists and journalists call this asymmetric partisanship. Both parties didn't evolve the same way. One became much more extreme than the other. And I find that very convincing. And in some ways, I'm trying to give an origin story of that. Here's a question coming in from a viewer. How influential is Newt Gingrich now? I mean, he, he's, he's still influential. Uh, after the Mount Rushmore speech the other day by President Trump, he was one of the most vocal 
uh, presence, uh, a vocal presence on Fox News talking about why, I can't remember the words he used, but this was one of the most important presidential speeches we've had. And he still uh, is a statesman for the Republican Party. I, I remember in 2016, during the primaries, everyone talked about where's the establishment, and they asked up the, the Bush family as the model of the Republican senior states people. But I think Gingrich is that person. And I think he still has a lot of sway uh, in the party. And he still has in the minds of many Republicans this gravitas when he speaks. And uh, so I, I still think he's an influence. And then he's just influential by what he did. That's ultimately the legacy of a president. He doesn't have to say a thing. Uh, and as we watch politics play out every day, you can see his roadmap is now the new normal. And, and that's the ultimate influence someone can have. Well, and that leads us to this next question about his legacy. And so our viewer wants to know, beyond the scorched earth tactics, what legacy does Gingrich leave behind in the realm of big ideas, if any? I don't, I mean, the funny thing about Gingrich is, is he's often associated or, or like to think of himself as the big idea politician, the professor politician. He was literally a historian, everyone, by the way. He had his PhD in history, taught history for a little while before going into politics. But I, the more I look, his ideas really are not what defines him. A lot of his basic ideas come right out of the general Republican playbook about issues like supply side economics. If, if there's one idea that I think was a big contribution of his was this anti-establishment populist conservatism. The idea that instead of focusing on left, right, liberal conservative, which he talks about, that the winning issue for Republicans is to say Democrats were part of this corrupt political system and shape it that way, define them that way, and use that as the uh, rhetoric to, to bring them down and constantly attack them. I and we hear that all the time still from President Trump. So I actually think that's his big idea. Uh, and, you know, it worked. I mean, he did deliver. He won the majority for the Republicans in 1994. Uh, and I think that's, that's the idea I credit him with. Hmm. We only have less than five minutes left. And so, um, I mean, I don't know if there's a way to end on an optimistic note, since you had already said that you don't think that the bitter partisanship will be going away anytime soon, but one of our, our viewers wants to know, in your opinion, as a historian, how do we reverse the damage done by Gingrich to the democracy? What's the roadmap to rising above hyper-partisanship? Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an optimist by nature. And so even though I write a lot of uh, books uh, and op-eds that can be pretty bleak sometimes, I, I've studied enough to see there is change in American history. So the story of Gingrich in itself, even though it leads in one direction, kind of shows nothing's inevitable. I mean, my whole story, it's a house of cards kind of thriller um, where in one year, one person wins, but had he not won, had Democrats stopped him, had Republicans pushed back, we could have had a very different direction for the country. So that means we're still in that place today. And you now have new generational people uh, coming into Washington in both parties. And, and so one thing we're looking for that would allow this our leaders, Gingrich type leaders, who have grown up with this function and who kind of try to win support for a very, very different future. Uh, a second thing which is effective in American history is grassroots pressure. I'm a big believer. A couple books ago, I wrote about the Great Society, and, and one of the big arguments was Lyndon Johnson was a very important president, but it was ultimately the civil rights movement that, that moved the country out of a broken status quo. Uh, and, and grassroots change can do that. So leadership, grassroots politics, and finally, reform. The, the issues that are a little boring, but essential. Thinking about how our house districts created and thinking about the electoral college and how it works. All these elements, the rules of the game that we all accept, I think we need to pay attention to them if we want to create a different kind of politics. So that's my trifecta of what would have to happen in the next few years. Well, I think that that's interesting. And what you raise, I think, is what we're seeing, you know, writ large right now in terms of 
uh, grassroots and reform. I mean, that's, that's what all these demonstrations around the country are doing. And they have changed things. I mean, the, the uprising since George Floyd's death has changed local um, police forces already. It is already changing policy in local, you know, state legislatures about how they're going to deal with the police and everything. And they, and people are calling for reform and it's working. I mean, so it's like, it's sort of actually in interesting ways, I think counter to the Gingrich school, because these are our problems from the pandemic of coronavirus to all of the, you know, racial unrest and everything. Um, that I don't know if they can just be dealt with in a slogan. You know, I, I mean, I think that people are really crying out for real policy change and real answers. And do you think that, that the Gingrich style, as interpreted by the Trump style, is an effective problem? I mean, is it an effective just winning strategy? Or does it also have a problem solving strategy? It doesn't have a problem solving strategy. I, I really believe that. I, I don't think problem solving is central to what this mentality does. And, uh, you know, as a historian, it's easier to write about history than live through it. But as I live through the pandemic, it's very clear to me, there is no problem solving strategy on the table right now. And, and part of that, as we're seeing uh, in states that are now kind of facing this surge again, by not having problem solving, by just dealing with what's politically best and by politicizing masks or, you know, calling for openings rather than lockdowns as a political tactic, it undermined our ability to deal with a crisis that many other countries have dealt with much better and are actually going back to normal. So another thing that can happen related to the my trifecta would be Republicans, like this is a crisis so severe, so severe that it starts to change the conversation in the party uh, and people like the Lincoln Project all of a sudden start to get sway with actual voters. We're far away from that. Um, but, but because you don't problem solve and because we're living in a crisis, boy, if there was ever a moment you should see that conversation in the GOP, it's right now. Is there anything, Professor, that we've missed that you want to say about this or the book or anything? Yeah, I mean, I'd say my final thing, I, people, the nice thing people have been saying is it's an enjoyable read and uh, kind of uh, it has drama and it's a narrative. And I wrote it that way on purpose. I really, what I do in the classroom and what I do on CNN or what I do uh, in, in my books is I try to make politics digestible and engaging and interesting and to see that, you know, this is, so important to our country, but it's also fascinating to follow and understand. And I'm really hoping that this book is the kind of book you don't put down and it leaves you wanting to know more about politics because ultimately you need that at a minimum if we're ever gonna get to a place where collectively we're solving those problems and we're changing the way we do business. It's a great book and it's been really thought provoking for me. The book, again, is Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of a Speaker, and the Rise of the New Republican Party. It's been so wonderful to talk to you, Professor. Uh, just a great conversation and a great book. And before I let everybody go, I just will have a few messages from the Brennan Center. They are very grateful for NYU's Bradimus Center for collaborating on this program. And they also would like me to mention a couple more things before everybody goes. If you have not done so already, please go to complete your census form online at my2020census.gov. It's very quick. It's the most efficient way to get the census counted and done accurately. Tell everybody you know so that you can get it counted in 2020. And also, you can sign up to vote by mail or even participate in early voting in your state. Please do so. Uh, if you can't vote by mail or participate in early uh, voting, Call your local member of Congress and let them know that you would like those options to protect your vote. Uh, Professor Julian Zelzar, great to, great to talk to you. Great to see you virtually. I look forward to seeing you again some early morning in the green room very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for watching.